Toronto streetcars have long been the workhorse of the surface transit fleet in Toronto, but over the decades they've slowly been cut back and service has been reduced. So what changes do I think we should make to the streetcar fleet? Uh, some of the things we do in Toronto with our streetcars, the lines we operate, and the service we operate, such to improve and modernize the streetcar network and make it something that would be impressive in a global context, not just in a North American context, as the current TTC streetcar network is sort of seen to be. We need to change the streetcars from a slow, mixed traffic operation into a fast, high capacity tram system that we wouldn't be surprised to see in a European city. Let's talk about it. The first thing we need to talk about is rolling stock. Well, initially when I first saw the new streetcar design, I was really happy because at least we moved to something that is sort of like what you see in many European cities, a five segment tram. But there's a lot of improvements that could be made to the flexities and over time, my opinion of them has just diminished because they're kind of ugly. I don't think they're as good as the European flexity models. And again, there's a lot of changes I think would be helpful for them. Now I'm actually going to be doing a video comparing the tram or streetcar systems of Melbourne and Toronto in the coming weeks. So definitely subscribe and hit the bell icon so you don't miss that video. I think it will be interesting. The first thing we should consider for the network is whether we could have longer trams or coupled trams. Now you might be surprised to hear this, but it is possible for us to have longer trams on the network. Fortunately, our blocks are not necessarily very short, and for the most part, I don't see a ton of conflicts with having at least a seven segment version of our current streetcar model. There's also the potential in the future to order five segment models, which could be extended in sets of two to form 60 meter long, high capacity trams. Now there are a few potential issues with this that I wanna mention. First of all, I think with any future streetcar order, we should bite the bullet and get dual cabs and doors on both sides of the car. Now, to be clear, we don't necessarily have to use those doors or use that extra cab, but giving ourselves the flexibility would be very useful. Even if the first order rarely gets used in that dual directional operation, it's just a good feature to have because then once a large portion of the fleet is capable of having doors on both sides and operating in either direction, we can start to build infrastructure that works with that type of tram. This is okay because we have multiple maintenance and storage facilities, we have a number of routes, and so, you know, you can start to operate those cars on only one route as we did with the Flexities. For example, Spadina and St. Clair got Flexities first and they long operated with only Flexities instead of CLRVs. So it's totally possible to operate a segmented fleet like that and consistently operate certain cars on certain routes. Now, I'm not gonna get into Melbourne too much in this video because that'll be left for the later video I mentioned earlier, but it is worth mentioning for those who suggest that not having a single model of vehicle is just impossible and it's terrible economically, Melbourne has like eight types of trams. So I think in Toronto, we could afford to have, I don't know, three or four. Now, the beautiful thing about having these modern interconnectable bi-directional trams is that you could start to do interesting things on routes like King. For example, there's no reason we couldn't install crossovers in some locations and longer platforms, as well as islands in the few places they make sense. Island platforms would be particularly interesting on a route like Spadina because it would mean you'd be able to put the streetcar stops in one location. So passengers boarding streetcars in either direction would just have one platform, which does have its benefits to be clear. Like for example, being able to save on common amenities. Having crossovers would be super useful as well because they're much more space efficient. Eventually removing the need for most of the loops on the network would save us a ton of money, especially if we had have done it, I don't know, with this streetcar order. For example, the Union Station loop we have to design would be so much easier if we were able to use crossovers. In the long term, there's no reason we couldn't do development on the various streetcar loops that we'd be removing. Of course, these sites aren't giant, but there's a lot of things you can do with that amount of land in a city like Toronto where prices are very high. And of course, as I mentioned, being able to operate trams that are interconnectable means that for very busy routes like King, where frequency is basically already maxed out, we could start operating longer trams that would be able to deal with capacity. And I think that's a very wise investment to make. The next thing I wanna mention is modernizing operations and infrastructure. The thing I wanna start this section with is the switches on the network, because we have a big switch problem. The switch problem, in my opinion, can be broken down into two things. The first is we use single point switches. What this means is that instead of the usual switch that has you know, two points, basically two tracks that switch, we have single point switches. So only one side of the vehicle is essentially switched, 
they're on the switch track, the rest of the vehicle is simply pulled. Now this creates issues regarding how fast the streetcar can actually operate through switches, which creates a ton of operational issues with our streetcar network that impacts things like speed and the ability to get through intersections. As well as safety, frankly, because derailments are a real risk. Switching core routes over to modern dual point switches would be logical and it's what would happen in almost any other place around the world. Now the other issue we have with switches is that we frankly have far too many of them. Now there is benefit to being able to have flexibility for rerouting streetcars here and there, but removing switches has a big benefit. Switches, as I mentioned, have risk. They create extra wear, they are extra stuff to maintain, they reduce speeds, they have potentially safety issues. So removing them wherever possible makes a lot of sense. This is something else I'll be touching on in my Melbourne video. To be clear, there is benefit to having switches to say allow for diversions in important areas, but we could cut down the number of grand unions we have and make things a little less flexible in order to save a ton of money and improve our operations. Now we also need to improve the way we construct streetcar tracks and embedding unnecessary tracks like we've seen on the Queensway is not the way to do that. One thing we should do is provide more dedicated right of way. I think it's often suggested that narrower streets with only four lanes just couldn't handle a dedicated streetcar right of way because, well, there's only four lanes. If the streetcars take two, that leaves only two for the cars. The truth is we need to accept that that's the reality of a dense city center like Toronto, bite the bullet and do it. I think in some places the smartest design decision would be, in places where there's not, you know, driveways and the like, to completely remove the car lanes add in some bike lanes and just widen out the pedestrian space. That would create a really nice sort of space in, in the core areas of the city. And this can be done on a block by block basis. Maybe some blocks need road access, some don't. But on the whole, we should be dedicating more space to streetcars. Now I know it's hard to fit curbs in some places, but you know, we should use a mix of smart curb designs that maybe don't look like a traditional curb, but still protect the streetcar tracks from car traffic. We can consider using green track like it's going to be used on the Eglinton Crosstown and if absolutely necessary, we can just paint the concrete like they do on Viva to show that this is a dedicated space for streetcars. Assisting all of this along, we can deploy streetcars with cameras in them, much like is done on the 14th Street busway in Manhattan, that can detect cars that are in the way of a vehicle and have the operator just click a button and find drivers that are in the way of streetcars on dedicated sections, which would go a long way to sort of teaching drivers not to use those exclusive streetcar sections and not to make illegal moves like turning or going straight in places they're not allowed. On the network as a whole, we should be operating way more one seat rides. We have 10 or so streetcar routes right now, but other tram networks around the world operate 20, 30 and more routes. And the way they do this is they operate a lot more one seat rides. The streetcar network is a network and we should be benefiting from that. Now this could start with peak only streetcar services that operate some unique routings. For example, maybe you operate a streetcar from Broadview and instead of going to the usual routes of Dundas or King, you operate some of those cars to College or Queen. This would allow people at the University of Toronto, for example, or working south of the Eden Centre to more easily access their destinations, travelling from the eastern side of the Bloor Danforth line and vice versa on the west. With smart network planning though, you could expand this to an all day affair and just have far more routes operating overall. Core sections of the network could get more frequent service and there would just be more trips that are available to people. One seat rides are really important because transfers are not exactly pleasant on the streetcar network and streetcars aren't all that frequent right now. That both enables this more one seat rides approach and also gives you a reason why one seat rides make more sense. Now with regard to stops, we need to enhance streetcar stops. There's no reason stops on the Spadina streetcar shouldn't look exactly like those stops on the Eglinton Crosstown on the surface. They should have presto prepayment when you're at the stop. They should have full ticket vending machines, nice canopies, next streetcar arrival screens and the like. This would be especially important if we're operating routes going to different locations. On the whole, advocating for better streetcar stops is something I don't see nearly enough of in Toronto. A lot of the same advocates that push for LRT with enhanced stops and improved amenities don't seem to be pushing for the same for the regular streetcar network, and that seems kind of obvious to me. In key locations, it may also be worth considering improved station connections and more underground sections for routes. For example, there's going to be the new Ontario line passing through downtown Toronto, and we might want to consider some underground streetcar connections in a few places to it. I'll leave it up to you to think about where those might be. Now, the last portion of this video is going to talk about expanding the actual network itself. 
There's a lot of dense areas of Toronto that currently aren't served by streetcars. Many of them previously were, and streetcar routes were cut back over the decades, but I think we need to reinstate some of those services. For example, traveling north of Bloor in a lot of places, the density in the urban form doesn't look any different from when you were south of Bloor, so it seems natural to extend the streetcar network. Streetcars also have a lot of operational benefits. You need less operators, the maintenance should be less expensive overall, and so expanding the network to remove some of the need for buses is valuable. Plus, streetcars are zero emissions. Now, I'm going to try to shoot these off rapid fire because I have a lot of them. Let's go. First, obviously the Queen Streetcar should be extended up to the Mr. Christie site and expanded to serve the area around Park Lawn far better because there are a ton of condos there and I think the service could be used much better. I also think considering extending the Queen Streetcar all the way out to Port Credit might make sense. Port Credit's obviously going to have the Huron Ontario LRT. It's a pretty important GO station already and having a streetcar connection could help feed both of those lines. Plus, it's not all that far from the current terminus at Long Branch. We should also extend cars north of Dundas West up to the loop at Runnymede. Serving the junction makes a ton of sense. It's a very hot neighborhood, there's lots of growth and new development, and it's just dense. Why wouldn't you serve it with streetcars? I also think at the same time, creating a connection up to the St. Clair streetcar via Keel Street would make a ton of sense because it kind of creates some network redundancy. Imagine if there was an issue on Bathurst right now, it's going to be difficult to get cars from St. Clair, which is kind of isolated, to the rest of the network. Having that secondary connection up on Keel would be very useful in that case. A route on DuPont would be another interesting addition. The connectivity is already there if you're traveling north of Dundas West, and you can intersect with the streetcars on Bathurst, as well as potentially a Spadina streetcar if it were to be extended north, and you have the benefit of being able to perhaps relieve some of the central sections of the Bloor Danforth line. I realize I may have said DuPont wrong. I don't know what's going on today. And anyways, let's get back to the video. There's of course also the potential for another subway interconnection at DuPont Station, and just general network connectivity benefits between various other streetcar lines. The St. Clair streetcar could be extended west to Jane to help intercept some traffic from the busy bus route there. Bathurst could have streetcar service reintroduced if we fix some of the grades on the very steep hill there. I would suggest some sort of trenched cut and fully dedicated lanes on Bathurst since it would be obviously a quite an important line. We could continue cars north on Broadview to serve the Cosburn station on the Ontario line, which would provide some nice connectivity for local communities, as well as a useful last mile connection. It's also worth pointing out that for examples like Broadview and Dundas West, it's not hard to actually add that connection north. Streetcars traveling north would simply loop around the station and continue north and vice versa for streetcars traveling south. Though you could imagine a future where there's underground streetcar stops interchanging with these stations, which would be a nice to have if we could get our construction costs to be reasonable. That Cosburn line could extend east-west all the way over to Woodbine, where streetcars could travel south to connect with the existing streetcar tracks on Girard. Not only would this add a new subway station interconnection onto the streetcar network, but you would serve important destinations in East York, including having streetcars not far away from Michael Guerin Hospital. There's also probably benefit of extending streetcars north from Kingston Road on Main Street up to this other streetcar section on Main Street, just to add a bit more overall network connectivity and redundancy again to the network. There's also rationale to extend the section of streetcar tracks on Kingston Road east to Victoria Park and then traveling north up to the subway station there, providing yet another subway station connection to the streetcar network, which would be valuable for transferring customers. Now, the last thing I'm going to propose is quite out there, but I think it's an important thing that we need to recognize, especially if we're starting to use the streetcar network to its maximum. We need new downtown trackage. The issue here is that we have a lot of branches going everywhere and technically only four downtown trunks going east-west, which is probably not enough to handle all the streetcar traffic we could potentially need. To be fair, Richmond and Adelaide have one-way streetcar tracks, but that's certainly not perfect. What I would propose is a new streetcar line traveling on Eastern from Leslie, near the Leslie Barnes, all the way over to Front and then over to Bathurst. This new line would provide a lot of great connectivity to important growing areas of the city, paralleling the route south on Queen's Quay, noting that the rail corridor is a major barrier, and so transit connectivity provided on the south isn't necessarily useful for people on the north. This also provides us a new route to potentially feed some services onto during the busiest times of day. This is an issue because currently the Queen and King streetcars share portions of their tracks when crossing the Don River. Separating those tracks is important if we want maximum capacity on the network as a whole. Now I know a lot of the ideas here are quite out there, but the point I'm making is that there's a lot of ways we could improve the streetcar network, and not all of them are hard. 
Improving stops or providing more dedicated space for streetcars is low-hanging fruit that would drastically improve the transit network in the densest and most transit-rich areas of the city. A lot of these changes don't need to happen at once. They can be gradual. Ordering better streetcar vehicles is something we can do when we order new streetcar vehicles, something which we seem to be planning on doing relatively soon. And 60 streetcars is a nice little mini fleet. Anyways, with these changes, I think we could have a modern world-class streetcar network that would once again be the envy of the world and would no longer feel like the legacy network that it had originally been. Thanks for watching the video. I'll see you in the next one.